So I went to my local theatre recently, love me a bit of amdram me, and I was watching a play called Lady Windermere's Fan, which is by somebody I'm a fan of, or at least the writing of, Oscar Wilde. And I was sitting there, I'd had my little pre-show drink, I was all cosied up, ready to see some theatre, and my ears pricked up because I heard a phrase that I have loved for a really long time. Time. But it wasn't coming from the mouth of a hero, and it wasn't said in an incredibly sentimental way. In fact, I was left feeling, eh. I don't really think that means what I think it means. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Lena. I'm trying to live a more shrewd and spirited life. So if you'd like to come along with me on that, get a little gumption, you can click subscribe. I upload every Monday and uh, it's delicious usually, or at least I enjoy it. Um, today I wanna have like a little mini rant, a little tiny rant about the misinterpretation of inspirational quotes, specifically four that I've come across in my life that I've been like, Huh. But generally this tendency we have as humans to romanticise abstract phrases and imprint our own feelings about them onto them, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, we'll get into that at the end, but I definitely think it's been really interesting for me to discover some of the quotations that I've held up as beautiful as inspirational don't have the history that I thought they did. Let's get curious. Uh, I've got four examples to show you today and I would love to hear yours in the comments below if you've ever discovered something about a quote that you've loved that's actually kind of weird. Let's get into the first one. So the first one is we're all in the gutter but some of us are looking at the stars. There's even a beautiful bookshop in Dublin that I love called the Gutter Bookshop inspired by this quote. You'll see it in a lot of living rooms. I definitely think I had it on my MySpace back in the day. You might see it plastered on a welcome mat or a living room wall and it sounds really beautiful. It's like, wow, that's so true. That's so true. But this is the quote that I discovered in my local theatre recently when I was sitting there in the back row swirling my wine. And the problem with it cropping up in an Oscar Wilde play in general is, is your first alarm because Oscar Wilde was essentially the Joe Lycett of his day, <laughs> a sarcasm king. And this phrase comes out of the mouth of somebody called Lord Darlington, who is, spoiler alert, a Tory arsehole. <laughs> uh, and not only that, he's just hit on Lady Windermere and she has turned him down. He's incredibly put out, angry about this, slight incel energy going on. And the whole theme of the play is kind of, I think, the treatment of women. They're in this kind of after party old boys club drinking circle and they're talking about how they're allowed to be bad people. That bad men are what women actually want. A character called Cecil says, don't be led astray into the paths of virtue. Reformed, you would be perfectly tedious. That is the worst of women. And he goes on to basically explain that if you're a nice man, women won't want you. Nice guys finished last. What they want is a fixer upper, a man who is cruel, incompetent, a mess and they want to try and fix you. So it's better to be a bad person because you're more likely to get a wife. <laughs> Lord Darlington is essentially agreeing with him and saying, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars, putting Lady Windermere on a pedestal, saying that he's happy to stay in the gutter because she's the star he looks up to. And it's this kind of fetishy, weird thing. The we in that statement isn't we, humanity. We're, we're all like a little bit messed up, but we're, we're looking at higher things. It's men, it's men, that's what he means. He means men are guttural filth and that's just the way of the world <laughs> and the women are the stars. Sure. So while I love the sentiment of this quote, this idea that even though we are all wretched human beings, we have this ability to appreciate beauty, it's not it's not exactly what it's saying and, and everything in that play is is dripping with sarcasm. So so there's also that. The second one, I've heard read at weddings and I've also seen inscripted on some gravestones. It's the phrase, what will survive of us is love. It's by Philip Larkin. He's one of my favorite poets. He's kind of the poet that got me into poetry because I had a teacher in sixth form that really liked him and he was from Coventry. And when you get some of his poems explained to you, you're really like, oh, that's kind of clever. And this phrase is from one of his most famous poems, An Arundel Tomb which is 
inspired by a statue that's in Chichester Cathedral. It's a kind of tomb monument of a earl. We think it is the Earl of Arundel, but again, there's people, people debate that, and his wife, Eleanor. Yeah, Eleanor of Lancaster. What's significant, but not completely unusual, about these tombs is that on top they are depicted as holding hands. Because it's so old, if it is them, they were living in like the 1300s, almost everything has worn away about this monument. Their faces, their expressions, what they're wearing, even the writing around it, it isn't really legible, which is why we're not exactly sure that that's who they are. We're also not even sure if they were originally holding hands. These two tombs were in separate parts of the cathedral, I think, and then in the 1850s this sculptor started restoring it and kind of sculpted the hands together to be held. So this poem by Philip Larkin is talking about this kind of almost ironic fetishization of love, this idea that time has worn away their faces and the markings around the base of the statues. It is a really beautiful poem, but it's kind of about that idea of love, not love itself. And the last verse where that phrase comes from goes, Thus, time has transfigured them into untruth. The stone fidelity they hardly meant has come to be their final blazon and to prove our almost instinct, almost true. What will survive of us is love. So what is most likely is that this statue wasn't commissioned in an effigy to the everlasting love of two people, but some sculptor's idea of that love. What is most likely is that the importance of these monuments when they were made were to show how important and how rich these people were, how more, how much more important they were than ordinary people, and it was their station that was being emphasised by the clothes that they were probably sculpted wearing, the things that were said about them on the bottom of the tomb, but of course time doesn't care about that, and that's kind of cool, I guess. But whenever people read that out, I'm always like, that's not romantic. They literally, he said it's almost instinct, almost true. But I also think there's something kind of cute about us humans who don't really care about people's titles in history or what they thought they'd be remembered for. We want to know who they cared about. We want to know who they loved, even if it's not true and probably a complete fantasy and they could have well had a really unhappy slash unconsensual marriage. Just cheerful things. The next one, I took the road less travelled. This is a quote from Robert Frost. It was one of my like favourite poems when I was a teenager and I definitely took this out of context a lot because I wanted to be a rebel. This poem is about somebody who is travelling through a wood and can't decide which road to take. Should I choose the smoothest course? Steady as the beating drum. Should I marry Cocoam? It's an age-old symbolic question and the writer explores both paths and tries to convince himself that one is less well trodden, it's grassier, it wants wear, but he admits to himself actually there wasn't that much in it, he, the time had worn them really down about the same, he says, and at the end of the poem he kind of almost sarcastically concludes, I took the one less travelled by and that made all the difference, but he sh says, I shall be telling this with a sigh, some ages and ages Hence, this idea that you want to tell yourself that your choices aren't arbitrary and it made all the difference to go one way or the other, when I think if you read into what Robert Frost is actually saying, he's kind of saying, eh, we will always mythologise our choices retrospectively if they turn out to be good choices. <laughs> the last one is, well-behaved women rarely make history on many of our coasters in 2009, 2010. I don't think I had a poster of this on my wall at uni, but I may very well have flirted with the idea of buying one. It's often attributed to anybody from Marilyn Monroe to Anne Boleyn <laughs> to Eleanor Roosevelt, but it's actually from a paper by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, Virtuous Women Found New England Ministerial Literature from 1668 to 1730. Five. Now, if you read even the beginning of this paper and also some of the other articles on it, you'll realise that it, it's actually about how ordinary women weren't remembered and how that's bad. It talks specifically about this period of women who didn't do anything extraordinary and that it's ridiculous that you had to have misbehaved to have your life recorded as a woman. The quote is used as an almost, now I think about it, kind of weird way to justify activism or being radical because you want to be forever remembered. Like there's a kind of ego motivation there that's a bit weird, but that's actually kind of not what the paper's saying. The paper's 
are almost saying what I would say is the opposite. Not, you won't be remembered if you don't go out there and misbehave and be radical. The paper could be called, Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History, and that's wrong. <laughs> My question for you is, does it matter? Does it matter that we've reinterpreted and reappropriated these phrases for big points in our lives, like funerals, weddings, picking the posters for our university inspirational walls? Because if they have brought us comfort and if we have found meaning in the phrases, even if they're not the original meanings, does it matter? In some cases I would say, no, it's harmless fun, it's kind of sweet, and we can kind of learn our almost instinct, almost true feelings about what we want to believe believe about the world rather than what the artists were saying about the world. But in other ways, I'm like, the truth is way more interesting. And I imagine that there are examples where misinterpreting what somebody's said can at best slow down progress a little bit, and at worst, maybe cause some shit. <laughs> Learning that Marie Antoinette definitely didn't say let them eat cake and was kind of used as a scapegoat by misogynists was a uh, shaking. I am shaken. Consider me shaken. And I know that there are loads of instances where it's kind of not ideal. Let me know what you think in the comments and if you have any examples of phrases that you know have been interpreted wrong, because I'm always looking to add to my little library of knowledge. Thank you so much for watching this video. This video has been made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure that my channel keeps happening and I get to keep making these ranty little videos just for you. If you like this video, you might like some of these videos. Thank you for watching Frog Snog out.